to Tabula Rasa, bitches. Hello, hello. Hello. My name is Allie. And I'm Nick. And welcome to Season 1, Episode 5 of Tabula Rasa, bitches. We are so glad to have you here. In Tabula Rasa, bitches, you'll listen as two decades-long friends jump back into the world of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and relive the show that brought them close together and taught them so many of the values they still cherish today. As always, we are going to give a spoiler warning for our friends listening in. We're going to be discussing this episode, spoilers and all. If you haven't watched and you don't want to hear any spoilers... Go ahead and go do your watching, come back. We can't wait to have you back here. Each episode of Tabula Rasa, bitches, we'll dive into an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and discuss the lessons that can be learned from our favorite Sunnydale warriors and the supernatural creatures they use their talents and friendship to overcome. Today, we'll be discussing Season 1, Episode 5, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date. Why is, why is it I nice have a question for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, don't. Or, like, depending on the boy, if he sucks, go ahead and that's, kill that's him. True. But, like fair. like, fair enough. My question to you is, where do I learn about this this strange podcast title? This strange podcast title? Well, if you have that question in your mind, that means you didn't listen to our first episode. So, naughty, naughty listener, you can go back over to episode one, where we talk about where we got our episode title or our show title tabula rasa <laughs> bitches and so go uh, do that you just homework. wait till you're clued in friends it's a good one it's a good one that's true yeah so for everyone who who isn't initiated to that episode you have you have something to look forward to we love a homework moment we do ali do. do you mind if i share with our friends this episode summary i would be delighted if you would do so and I would be delighted to do so. So we are perfectly lined. This episode summary. Buffy is beginning to feel the lack of a boyfriend in her life. But when the quiet and mysterious Owen starts to pay her attention, things start to look up. Meanwhile, Giles and Buffy learn of the master's plan to bring forth the anointed one, a powerful vampire who is destined to help him fight the Slayer. Buffy is unconvinced about the prophecy and goes out on a date with Owen the following evening rather than following up on a lead that the anointed one may be about to rise. Giles follows up on the lead alone and finds himself in trouble with a group of vampires. After Willow and Xander interrupt Buffy's date with Owen, the three arrive to save Giles, not knowing that Owen has followed them. Buffy finds the strength to kill the presumed anointed one after he hurts Owen. The following day, Buffy decides that perhaps dating is pretty dangerous after all. She breaks things off with Owen and sighs with relief that the prophecy didn't come to pass. Or did it? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, definitely some solid don't make an assumption in this episode. Uh, with For sure. There's so many stuff. So many, so many quotes in this one, too. I'm really excited to chat about that with you, Allie. Yeah, this is a good one. This is one that I ended up watching a lot as a kid because for some reason I kept thinking that this was the one where she has Angel over and the whole like shirtless tattoo thing. For some reason, I kept thinking that that was this episode. So I kept putting it on and then like, oh, different date, different boy, whatever. So I'm very familiar with this episode. I wouldn't be mad about seeing Owen shirtless. I wouldn't be mad at all. No, no, he's cute. He's cute. I mean, he's no David Boreanaz, but he's cute. <laughs> okay, okay, flag that for yourself. I have a question for you later on that we're going to come back to you that gets at that point that you just said. Excellent, excellent. What is your first note? So my first note is, yeah, glad the grunts got better. Uh, Buffy's fighting in the beginning i noticed that too yeah yeah they are a lot they're they're getting they're getting better they continue to improve she clearly got some coaching i get it hey fight choreo that is a specialty all on its own um i think we all think we know how to make sounds until we're asked to do it especially especially if you're especially if you're not the one doing those moves because because obviously she had a stunt double so that means that she was going in adr um which is I don't know what ADR stands for, but it's when the actors go into a studio afterwards and re-record lines either for clarity or they have to change things. Um, Sometimes that's when they also change things for international release, all that kind of stuff. So that means that she was going into a booth later and 
trying to time uh, ah, uh, you know trying to microphone yeah so it's it's hard you know i didn't sound that great doing it just now i thank you for that education ali i didn't know about that you're so welcome me my first note is a quote from buffy where she says giles don't mention it it was my pleasure to make the world a safer place for humanity (laughs) <laughs> and that vibed with me, particularly here, particularly today. Oh, yeah? I am going to speak in generalities here because I don't want to throw anybody under the bus who might be listening. But I had an Good experience call. today where <laughs> I was sharing a win that I had with somebody. And that person didn't mean to. They did not mean to. And they explained it afterwards. But they immediately started asking me a million detailed questions about this win and it was like just a little and I interrupted them and I was like okay did you mean to say good job Nick (laughs) and and she said no I didn't I was gonna get to that and we had a good it was a it was a productive discussion it was a healthy it was it was good it was good but I then after that conversation I watched this episode and it, (laughs) it it resonated with me it did yes I used to have a lot of those moments uh after shows with my dad would be like oh so-and-so was did a great job or you should lift your chin up at this moment so that the light's in your face and I'm like did you mean good show right we'll get to know did you mean great job right person who's not my director you know and there's going to be time (laughs) for feedback there is I'll share information with you but we're going to celebrate first yeah how about you just give me flowers and shut the fuck up absolutely come on Bruce I love you Bruce I would die for you yeah (laughs) So, so I love the moment when Giles picks up the ring that the vampire left behind. She goes, oh, great. I'll slay them. You'll fence their jewelry. <laughs> and I just had this immediate sketch, like SNL sketch spinoff in my head, like still the same world, still the same seriousness that's going on. But then there's this goofy cartoon spinoff of actually Giles Pawn Stars style selling off and he keeps getting questions about like where these came from when he has to either make stuff up or he just tells the truth but they don't believe him he's just this wacky librarian who has really good vintage stuff i don't know i just w- my head went off and i was like i would watch that show i would also watch that show i want to see how much money he gets for a ring from the order of aurelius that would be so interesting such a specific thing people would be like i don't know it's like trust me it's a thing um i uh, continue to be impressed with how terrifying the master is just his makeup his costume his lair has gotten creepier mm-hmm. and i really like in that scene how we get kind of just just a little taste just a glimpse of his strength when he lifts the dude by his mm-hmm. neck mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is uh an opposite reaction to that scene that i had because i have the note lol the master more like the sass master <laughs> oh that isn't in the prophecy at all or whatever he says. i know i know I was, okay sarcasm much i just i i loved that moment because again you were saying he is he is very scary so then when he also is very flippant i, I don't know something about it i love it and i think that's what makes him such a great villain because he has those moments Get yourself a villain that's both scary and is a little bit of a bitch. Right, He's a exactly. little bit of a bitch. He's just someone who can do both. Right. Two points for the Slayer, and the Watcher has yet to score. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty great. So many good Slayer vibes from this one. Um, oh, yeah. I think that her green dress in the in the dress, what did I just say? Green dress in that mm-hmm. chunky ring she's wearing mm-hmm. are amazing. Yes, I had a chunky ring, very similar. I actually still have it. I was really glad when I found it recently because the 90s slash 70s are very much in. So I, mm -hmm. they've been in for a while, but finally, like on a larger scale, people are catching on and I'm all about it. So very excited. Um, I want a picture of that ring. It's super cute. It has rhinestones in it. So I have, I wrote down uh, the quote from Giles. The mere fact that you would want to check out a book would be grounds for a holiday. Um, excuse me? Did she not just give you an I told you so on the research you were just doing? And he's like, oh, no, no, I can't. I can't find it. She's like, yeah, I saw that. It's it's right here. And she like literally finds the page and totally schools him. And then he's like, Buffy, the fact that you would even pick up a book would be astonishing. Bitch, 
Like, yeah, Giles, I'm going to need you to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Before I come into the TV opposite ring style and wreck yep. yourself. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't shade Buffy for this. And we actually do learn throughout the... Well, yeah, we learn throughout the series and it's already been established by a uh, science teacher who ended up dying that mm-hmm. Buffy's smart. She's and, smart. It's it, not well, it's not for lack of intelligence. Yeah, no, not at all. She's just, you know, a superhero and that's the whatever. Right. Um, no, I had this whole tangent in my head because she, she says this later, but she says, you know, Clark Kent had a day job. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. actually, how good of an employee would Clark Kent have been? Like how he worked in a newspaper. How was he getting those articles in on deadline? Yeah. And I bet I bet he knew his priorities very clearly and did not convey to his employer what those priorities were obviously yeah <laughs> there's no way he was missing deadlines left and right yeah um or i have Lois a, is writing them for him wouldn't that be fucking typical some dude just gets to publish them on the back of a woman's work we mm-hmm. do the, i honestly wouldn't have even been surprised if some of the originals were written like that he's like oh thanks lois blah 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 um, I have a quote from Giles in this scene that I thought was funny. Uh, also, I think that it's hilarious that we learn that Buffy clearly has a brooding, mysterious type with our friend Owen here. That um, is so true. The quote from Giles that I really like, or the exchange, uh, he goes, she's quite a good poet, referring to Emily Dickinson. I mean, for, and Buffy says, a girl. <laughs> Giles goes, an American. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Giles. You saved your, you checked yourself there. That was a good idea. Yeah, I believe that, that that's what he meant. Yeah, it was yeah. just a good save. But it is, yeah, that is great timing. Oh. We've all had that moment of like, you better watch the next words that come out of your mouth. You <laughs> Choose them carefully. Thin ice. Um, can we talk about lying about interests? So this whole time, she's like, oh, Emily Dickens. And he's like, Dickinson? Uh, <laughs> And she's like, I love her. She's great. She's my favorite. I read all, me, I love books. And it's like, actually, and lots of people would make the same move. But if anyone's listening out there who thinks that pretending you already know about a subject to impress a potential love interest is a good idea. No, no, no. Better idea. Be really interested in it Mm. and share it with them. Oh, you know, I've always meant to read Emily Dickinson. What if we went to a park and read some together? Or what if I sit and listen to you talk about how much you love Emily Dickinson? I did do this as a move. Um, a now friend, who at the time was a romantic interest, or one-sided, uh, expressed one of his, uh, his favorite movies. And I was like, that's your favorite movie? Huh, I think you would like my favorite movie. What if we got together and watched them together? Off taping, I need to know who this is, but you could name him later. But I keep going, keep going. (laughs) No, that's it. It was, and we did. He came over and we watched both movies and they were not short movies. Uh, (laughs) So, what movies did you watch? We watched Grand Torino and Dead Poet Society. Which one do you think was my favorite? Oh, Dead Poet Society. Yeah. That should, that was a, that was a gimme for you. Grand Torino. Do I know this person? I think so. Yeah, obviously I know this person. Who? Okay, I have an idea. It's not it so. It's not over my embarrassment. It's not wanting to embarrass him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. It'll leave a little mystery for folks. That's good. Speaking of brody guys who like poetry, anyway. Oh, okay. (laughs) Now I know exactly who it is. That's funny. Um, I give it away um, with that one, huh? This is just good dating advice, though, right? Like you don't want to fake if you take interest in somebody in something that that you want to know about and they're already interested and they're totally going to go for that. They Absolutely. People love explaining things they're interested in. Ask me about yeah. World of Warcraft sometime, Allie. Oh, absolutely. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I won't date you then. No, I'll still date you. Please date no, me. Because it, it sort of leads into some of the best dating advice I ever I ever read. Um, I read Modern Love by Aziz Ansari, which whether you think he's questionable or not, there's some really good information in the book. Um a lot of people, they do all the same things on dates. They always go to the same restaurant or they always do that same activity of like coffee or drinks or whatever. And so you're wondering why you're never having success with dates. It's like, well, you're always doing the same thing. But what actually creates a connection is shared experiences. 
So finding something to do. So like monster truck rally, like even if neither of you end up being into it, you've now both been to a monster truck rally. Like it's a shared thing that you can now you have a more to talk about and B now it's a new thing that bonds you two. Neato. Yeah. Oh, dating advice with Allie. This should be a regular segment on our podcast. Yes. Me and my, my wealth of knowledge. You just gave two really good pieces of advice there. That's In true. The next scene i have an uh well i guess it's not an iconic quote from cordelia but it's an iconic quote that is because of cordelia i think i know what uh, you're gonna say <laughs> so uh buffy has just gone to sit with owen who's sitting alone and cordelia tries to sweep in and she hits buffy <laughs> and buffy goes wow cordelia's hips are wider than i thought <laughs> <laughs> Not that we should be body shaming other women or putting other yeah, women yeah, down, yeah. but oh, <laughs> LOL. Um, I love, so they're ta- So Owen's talking about going to the bronze or uh, Cordelia's inviting Owen to the bronze. And he says, says who's going to be there? And she's, I mean, I'm going to be there. And he says, who else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote down that he's just so innocent and sweet and socially unaware. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> But I just I just love I love that because I feel like that's also a dating moment or an interest moment where we've all had where you're like you're trying to get your crush to come to something. It's like, cool. So who all, who all is going? And you're like, well, I guess that means I'm not enough. Yeah, I'll just go fuck myself. Thanks. Yeah, I do love his initiative, though. So for all of his like social shyness or it kind of seems like it's not that he can't be social. He just chooses very sparsely to. But he does very quickly go. Well, Buffy, would you would you want to go? How about at eight? And it's like, oh, all right then. He does definitely give very clear signs of his interest because he like he makes the plan. He is bold and it's refreshing. We see that later on too. Mm-hmm. When um maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't. But when he's like when she doesn't show up, sorry, I'm jumping ahead here, we can go back. But when she doesn't show up and he he goes up to her the next day mm-hmm. and he's like, Where were you? Yep. I wanted to that yes, Owen. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yeah. Communication. Communication. That's good stuff. So for all um, all of the red for all of the red flags that he does eventually end up putting up, that is a very green green flag for sure. I love that we are getting this glimpse into Buffy as an actual teenager. Yes. Yes. I love that. I I have written down the quote um when Giles is talking about her like going out and patrolling. She's like, but cute guy, teenager post-pubescent fantasies <laughs> and again clearly not dumb using words like post post-pubescent totally she's smart give her and, some credit and self-aware enough that this is a normal developmental milestone come on let me do this this exactly. is a thing that teenagers like that's i don't know that's impressive yeah and so they do she does go after after they are uh come up with nothing with the prophecy stuff and, you know, I was a little bummed that she sees she sees uh, Owen and Cordelia dancing. And it's like, but he's clearly not into it. Read some body language, hon. That's funny. I had the opposite reaction. Really? I, I, so when Buffy looked at, have you ever had that experience where you have a crush on this dude and then you see him... Talking to somebody else or like showing some sort of interest in just that sinking feeling in your chest. You're, Damn it. Thought. Of course. Oh, I wanted. I and I felt like they did a really well. OK, so you also recognize they did a good job with that. You're just like, Buffy, that's not what he's doing. Come on. Yeah. I was yeah, going to say, yeah, yeah. I felt like they did a good job capturing that. Yeah, I think. Loss. Right. Because I can see where she felt that. And. Definitely, like, she was already feeling the pressure of being late and probably, like, already lots of bad self-talk on her part. And I do think that's probably very accurate to what a teenager would do. And we've been there. You know, I grew up with Anna Cook as my best friend. Every guy I ever introduced to her had a crush on her. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it, Anna. Because, Anna, you know it's true. Don't even fucking lie. Bitch, I hate you. Anna, (laughs) you better be listening. You better be listening as it comes out. Uh, She better because she's one of our friends who did actually watch Buffy because... There's going to be a lot of friends we're going to share this with who don't watch Buffy, but she's one of the ones who did. So she has. So to. this is a challenge to Anna Cook specifically. As soon as you hear us say this, put Allie and I in a group text and text us the word penguin. So we'll know that 
Ooh, I love that. Listen. I love that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I'm excited. Um, okay. So in the next scene with the van, with the creepy dude going off about the prophecy or whatever, mm-hmm. um, he asks the question to the other people in the van, are you willing to stand with the righteous? And I'm not in the van, but just to be clear, I am sure as hell not willing to stand with the righteous. Nope. You creepy fuck. On just about anything. Yeah, in no. most situations, but oof, God, that would be terrifying to be on a bus with that guy. Uh, yeah, it's just spewing all that. And then he's not even just sitting down. He gets up. Please don't get up. Please don't walk right. towards me. Please don't address me. At first, I just have secondhand embarrassment. And then I am yeah. afraid for my safety. Right. Because he's not your standard crazy person babbling to themselves. Right. Like, this is somebody who comes off threatening. He is clearly muscular. And he's got that, like, crease in his forehead. Like, he's angry about it. So it's, like, babbling craziness with intent. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely lots of... Like, he looks like a vampire before he even gets turned into a vampire. Um, Yep, don't love him. I don't don't love any of that for him. Yeah, gross. Um, I have a quote. Maybe this might be skipping. You did not have to swerve that hard. (laughs) 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 that's true it does yeah it kind of looked like an overcompensation i know it wasn't there i know i wasn't driving but i don't know i feel like that crash was a little unnecessary. you're supposed to be a good driver too sir right um oh i love the watches moment with uh, i wrote that down too oh uh, so cute going like because owen gives her the like really old tiny old-fashioned pocket watch which is like oh super cute moment very classy, Points and I Owen. would not expect anything less for him to have a classy pocket watch. Yeah. yeah, definitely not. But then I just love that cinematic moment of then panning over to Xander's cartoon watch. Fantastic. <laughs> Little Tweety Bird. Yes. I, so to be cute. fair, personally, I like Xander's watch for. Yeah, agreed. But yeah. it perfectly emblematic like, of uh, as the if, characters I, you know, and insecurity that Xander feels. Girls don't have big enough pockets she probably didn't even have pockets at all it's the 90s she probably didn't have any any pockets like she has somewhere to put a pocket watch true mm-hmm. good um, point i know that just saying um i love that buffy does normal teenager thing giles she is the strangest girl <laughs> <laughs> um but this is my first question for ally moment okay. in the episode we saw in the scene with the watches that Xander had decked out the inside of his locker with stuff. Mm-hmm. How did you decorate the inside of your locker? Well, that depends on middle school or high school. Because high school, we were allowed to carry our backpacks with us, so I did not use my locker. Um, past freshman year, I didn't even bother to like go find where my locker was. I didn't even know where mine was either. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, there's probably still a an umbrella in there or something. Uh, but middle school, oh my God, I took decorating my locker very seriously. Always went to Target and I would get the magnets and the mirror and the picture frame holders and the little magnetic thing, cup holder thing that you would put like extra hair ties or whatever and like the extra shelf for inside the locker. And every year I would make a collage in like open office or whatever. I wouldn't, it's not like I was cutting and pasting things. No, 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 no. I was full digital i make a collage of all the celebrities i had current crushes on um Ooh. and i would have all of those in my locker so yeah angel was probably almost definitely in my locker i bet do you uh, think you have any pictures of the inside of one of your lockers no Damn i it. may still have one of the collages somewhere because <gasps> i keep that shit it is it is really funny to see some of the stuff um tom welling clark oh my Kent god from still have Smallville. a crush on him oh, i god. mean he, Cheaper by the dozen as well. Oh yeah, Cheaper by the dozen. I will, and he was in Lucifer, and he may or may not be coming back to the role of Clark Kent. There's rumors, and he is still fine. Yeah, he's so sexy. Yes, so sexy. Yes. Um, if you have that collage, I need you to find it. If you have it, <laughs> I need to see it. I will look for it. Glorious. Thank you. In in two um, months when I'm actually back home. Uh, right. What What yeah, about you? What was your locker situation? So I. Well, similar to you in high school, did not even know where it was past freshman year. It was pointless. I don't think that I ever, I know that I wanted to deck it out, mm-hmm. but I felt like that was too feminine mm-hmm. and everybody 
else already thought I was gay and I was definitely not gay. Absolutely. I'm not yeah. gay. No. I, was, I was about to ask so, that. Did you think that was it part of trying to hide? Oh, yeah. Total toxic masculinity, internalized homophobia. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, OK, so, so fantasy world, middle mm-hmm. school, Nick, who would you have had in your locker or what would you have had in your locker? It's so funny you mentioned Tom Willing. If I were to make a collage for middle school, Nick, uh, Tom Welling, yeah, as Superman mm-hmm. in Smallville. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, so mm-hmm. fine. Who else? Yeah, David Boreanaz would have been there. Yeah, I watched Buffy in middle school. Mm-hmm. Who else mm-hmm. would have been in there? Um, oh, uh, Channing Tatum, still a crush. Hell, yeah. Step up era. Fuck, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. now I only love him even more after all the comedy stuff he's done. But we were already all over him just from Step Up. Yeah, get yourself a man who's sexy and funny. And dances. Um, I did decorate people's lockers for their birthday, though. Oh, that was always I a loved thing. that. That was so much fun. Yeah, that was always really sweet. Oh, middle school. What so a terrible time. I actually have a question written down here for you, Nicholas. Mm. Um, do you have a worst date story or a funny date story? Oh, my God. I do have a worst date story. Oh, God. One of my... Okay, it was in college. One of my friends... So... Ali, you and I went to Towson University. Um, one of my friends attended American University, which is far from Towson. That's where my big sisters went. Oh, and bless them. Bless them both. Yes. All. How many big sisters? Oh, yeah. Two, two, two. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my back track, friend, friend decided to set me up with somebody that she knew. Looking back, I'm pretty sure she, I think she only decided to set us up because we were too gay people and like naturally it's going to be good. whatever so i traveled all the way to american university i think we ended up taking like public Which transportation is far. Or that something. is from baltimore to dc and with public transportation that is rough they do not make it easy to go between those cities no they don't and then once i got to american university i still we still had some public transportation to do to get but once you're in dc it's a little easy. Whatever. whatever i'm saying it was it was an evening it was a night commitment dinner was so bad it was so awkward. Nothing in common whatsoever. I think he asked me what my favorite magazine was, which is a fair question to somebody who's interested. But I think I said Nickelodeon magazine because that was the <laughs> only I was a, I was a I was a 20 year old saying like just and then I had to. Get, oh, yeah, that was. a Oh, yeah, it wasn't great. Allie wasn't no, great. What about buddy. you? Any any funny, bad, funny, bad date dating stories? stories? Uh <laughs> Uh, it's funny to like, do I go with a sarcastically funny reference to my emotionally abusive ex or do I go with something that was like actually funny? Um, no, I don't really have, I, cause I, the thing I won't is- name him, but fuck that dude. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> uh, regrets. Um, no, anyway, no, I see the thing is I didn't date a lot. That's the thing. Like I didn't get asked out much. I mean- I had a date with my my middle school boyfriend, also a Nick. I definitely have a thing in my life for Nicks. And we okay, so went to... Me. Why won't you date me then? I tried so hard. Don't even act <laughs> like I didn't. <laughs> that is offensive for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Slap you across the face. Uh-huh. Um, so my middle school boyfriend and his first date was prom night. Not the night of, but like the movie with pretty, pretty snow. Cause my thinking was, we'll go see a scary movie. I'll get really scared and like jump over and cuddling and maybe kissing will ensue or whatever. It didn't even end up being scary. It was just sad. Cause it opens oh, no. up with this girl who was attacked by a stalker. She's currently in therapy, still having lots of PTSD. She's barely recovering enough to go to prom. And this is supposed to be this big, happy, joyous thing after this guy. I think he even like killed her parents or something. And now she's living with her aunt and uncle. Like serious trauma already starting off from minute one. She's probably never going to be okay. Or, you know, she has a long journey to get to okay. So she has prom night. And then obviously horror movie. Things go awful best friends die all this stuff she was already barely okay and now she's just never like lock her in a padded cell she's never gonna be okay like it just ended up being sad and no touching or like maybe i even tried to hold hands or something but we didn't or i was too scared to because it was middle school it was just a very unsuccessful date not not even not funny but just kind of yeah just kind of blame that 
that's okay. Things have gotten better for both of us with our lifelong partners. Yeah. I mean, I can tell, um, I can tell amazing date stories with my current partner. That'll be episode 5.5. It'll be great. Yeah. Um, it, in the next scene where Buffy is getting ready for her date. Yeah. I wonder if we wrote down the same quote here. Oh, uh, well, not a quote, but um, how insensitive can they be having Sander there? Yeah, that's a great. Like bit. she's profusely talking about this this date that she's going on with a different guy, obviously picking out an outfit, all this stuff. And like, OK, we all know. Let's not pretend like we don't all know that Xander has a thing for Buffy. Yeah. It's not their kindest move ever. <laughs> Rude. Or maybe he's like trying to show that he's OK. I don't know. I I also remember watching this as younger, and I think the fact that he was so in love with her had just escaped me. I thought that he had gotten over it. Or I don't know. The vibes that I get from him now is obviously he's like jealous and would like to be going on the date with Buffy instead. But the vibes that I got back then was that he was, it was like an overproductive brother kind mm, of thing. Okay. It could be both. It could be a bit Maybe. of both. Yeah. Um. Or like overprotective because you're in love with her or like like maybe right. he's acknowledged yeah. that he's not going to have her, but he's not ready for someone else to have her, which is fair. We've all been there. Like, no. OK, I get that. I get that. I well, it's fair for the situation to exist. Yes. It's not yes. fair to like put that on them. Yeah. But like, yeah, we've yeah, been yeah. there. OK, like, I, okay, I get yeah. that we broke up, but that doesn't mean I want to see you with someone else. Yeah, totally. I'm not saying yes, you can't be with somebody else, but. Doesn't mean I have to like it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That seems fair to me. Um, so the, what's the quote? The, the quote that I love is, uh, so Giles has come to be like, oh, it's the end of the world. And then <laughs> Buffy goes, if the apocalypse comes, beat me. <laughs> that is a good one. That's another, in a previous episode, I talked about how the DVDs would play a preview, a selected quote. When you press play on an episode, it would play the quote and then start the episode. That was the quote for this episode. So the good. apocalypse comes, beat me. I, I wrote down, a cranky slayer is a careless slayer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> True. Um, there's a quote from Owen that I don't love when they're in the bronze together. Mm, I bet I know what it is. I wonder. He says, I find most girls pretty frivolous. You know, there's a lot more important, important things in life than dating. It like Says the guy Shut pursuing up. a girl. Well, in this whole part of the beginning, I find most girls pretty frivolous. If you find, if you are categorizing most of any group as one thing. You're wrong. Then I think that, yeah. And the problem is probably with you. <laughs> most girls pretty frivolous. Why don't, do you just need to be more social? Like, yeah. do you just need well, to. Well, I also, I can see it definitely from his, like, he reads Emily Dickinson and he, has to have his Emily with him. And so he probably has like what today would be considered very like hipster perspectives. Yeah. Like, oh, I bet all you read is Vogue and Cover Girl or whatever. And he's like, oh, but you don't you don't read like real pain, blah, blah, blah. And a lot I feel like he can he talks about like how morbid she is and stuff. And I bet he has a very stable home life, gets good grades, mm. has decent friends. And is like desperately trying to feel he needs deep to be edgy. because he has yeah. yeah he's just this, this edge lord who's like talking about girls being frivolous and it's like you know what let people enjoy things people enjoy things and actually Teen Vogue has pretty provocative nuance sure Teen Vogue Teen Vogue was not a good example because they do lots yeah, yeah. of well no it's something and... that that somebody like Owen would be like oh Vogue is so frivolous or whatever but, but then it's, it's like when somebody says something no, they had like, interviews with bullshit. like Emma Watson and stuff like that um so yeah Team Vogue's actually like you know and also I just think it's so obnoxious to be dumping on something that you do it's like you're you were you're clearly dating right so, oh they're all just obsessed with dating uh oh uh we do have a message uh this episode features music by Velvet Chain the song Strong <laughs> I didn't know that. You looked it up. I did because um, cause I recognized the song off of Buffy the album. So I, I wanted to make sure I was pretty sure. But I definitely didn't remember the band name as Velvet Chain. So in that, when they're at the bronze on their date, uh, that is who's playing on, on the stage. That is Velvet Chain. How about that? That's yeah. good music. Hello, salty goodness. Ew. Also <laughs> gross. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this is Cord Cordelia reacting to Angel, which I think is a perfectly valid reaction. 
salty? Why is that the adjective? I don't know. <laughs> um, I do like I do like that quote. There's another quote from her. Pick up the phone, call 911. That boy's gonna need some serious oxygen <laughs> after I'm done with him. <laughs> Oh, girl. Uh, yeah, that's straight. That confidence. Girl, I, lo- uh, I love I do. I do love that like immediate blow to her confidence when he walks straight to Buffy. Yeah. Why is this happening to me? Yeah, yeah. That's good. I also love the immediate shift in Angel's physicality when Owen comes back from getting the drink or the food or whatever. You can just tell he immediately goes into like posturing mode. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. So this is this is where I um, this is a question that I think I know your answer to now. But based on what we know about Angel and Owen so far, I think I might say Owen's cuter. What? Yeah, I think. Yeah, just looking at the two of them together, I think I think Owen's the cutie there. I, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> i appreciate but, uh, it we'll, we'll have to di- agree to disagree on that I, one i i did oh. look up the actor who plays owen mm-hmm. he's still really cute i believe that i believe that no he's i mean i will not disagree that he is a cutie and he's definitely somebody like i would have had eyes for in high school as we <laughs> said previously definitely my type um but no them compared side by side no not a chance angel all the way all right, we'll see if our listeners agree with you or me. Mm. And right. then we very quickly get to issues with personality with Owen when he says, actually, that sounds kind of cool. Going to a, going to a morgue and it's like, ooh, red flag. Yeah, that's weird. Red, red flag. Red, red flag. Yeah. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, that's not normal. Maybe qu- going to a cemetery. Cool. Morgue? No. Going into a morgue. Yeah, I don't need to see that. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. We love a first kiss moment. Yes. And the angel's face. <laughs> oh, when Buffy kisses Owen. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Why is Willow so good at lying? Um, yeah. So they Xander and Willow here when they're interrupting their date, it's big, um, big lame parents crashing the hangout energy. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, Willow is she is she's so on quick it with right a story. Oh, yeah. And a good story, too. Not one of those, it was flying monkeys. And you're like, okay, well, you're, li- you're lying. No, she's like, she's on top of it. Right. And she's supposed to be the goody-goody. So, I don't know. Mm. Interesting skill for her to have. Interesting skill. There's there's some things we don't know about. I don't know. There's, I have something written about, like, the prophecy being vague. And, oh, I think Giles is talking about, like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess it could be pointing to this thing when the... um. I think it's when he's looking at the news article where the five people died in the bus crash. And he's saying, like, this could be the five people. And he's like, I know it's not rising from the ashes. It's like, well, prophecies are notoriously flowery, flowery language and vague so that they can come true. So, like, yeah, of course, of course, it's vague and weird and can be interpreted a million different ways. It's intentional. Yeah. Yeah, they're tricky. Um, so now we're at the point where, uh, Buffy, Xander Willow are in the morgue trying to save Giles. Yep, we yep, learn yep. that Owen has followed them. God damn it, Owen, whatever. When Buffy, I love Buffy's continued development here, really shining as a leader, mm-hmm. telling Giles yep. to like, hang on. She's made it. She says to Xander Willow. Watch him. Mm-hmm. Just the delegation there. It's nice to see. We love to see it. Yep. Definitely. Definitely a natural, natural born leader. Um, although I do have close the when they're looking through all of the, um, what are those called? Where the bodies are stored. All the doors mm-hmm. and stuff. Close the doors. Were you raised in a barn? Because they're just like leaving <laughs> all of them open. It's like everyone, someone's going to know that someone was in here rifling through all of these drawers. Yeah, you monsters. Come on. Do you think the cupboard's open at home? I hope not. God, I hope not. Hayden does. I have to go behind him and shut them. Um, <laughs> I have pork and beans written down. So this is when the dude wakes up. He's a vampire, and he start he come he breaks through the observation room window, and he's like pork and beans, pork and beans. I smell pork and beans. And I looked that up because I was like, is this some kind of like folky song, something? So I I 
put the quote into Google. And the first thing to come up is a Buffy chat room. Uh, and I took a screenshot. It's okay. This time will be edited out and post. That's what edit. Don't do it. Don't edit it out. It'll be fun. So, uh, okay. So the quote is, he is risen in me, pork and beans, pork and beans. I can smell you. You're the chaff, unblessed. I'll suck the blood from your hearts. He says I may. So Vampire Borba is simply equating, I guess Borba is the name of the dude. Um, so he's simply equating the teens fleeing from him to food here. And it's specifically this kind of food because canned pork and beans is probably something he's familiar with, whether as a transient or from prison or the army. And he's equating them to something cheap since they're insignificant to him now in his new exalted state wow so that was someone's interpretation but i think that's pretty spot on that's spot on yeah my goodness so that's not something i would have pulled out but yeah good for you doing that research Heck Allie. Yeah. wow Heck yeah internet i wrote down so this is before the dude has woken up mm -hmm. they're barricading the door or whatever mm -hmm. and xander i so xander puts the moving various things in front of the door Xander places a cushion yep. <laughs> from a couch, and then Willow puts a lampshade on the chair. Yep. Then, Good job. Right. Thanks for that, guys. Yep. That's great. I had that exact same thought of, you know, that's going to do a lot. I'm so, yeah, I'm so awesome. glad you took those extra seconds. But yep. I, I, yeah. Um, I'm not sorry for asking this question. Mm -hmm. The crazy vampire. Is he kind of hot? come on not even a little bit no no whatever I, with, with that much religious drivel being spewed out of his mouth i just no no i mean maybe if i saw him smile like un <laughs> unknit that brow but if you go to church with him i'm sure he'll smile <laughs> <laughs> fine i'll just thirst over him alone yeah whatever. i mean more for you <laughs> okay so buffy's talking to owen the next day and she's saying you know the the usual it's not me it's you or it's not it's not <laughs> for Ian slip uh she's yeah. saying that it's not you it's me and it's like no 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 it's definitely you you're, yeah we found yeah. out that you're crazy and you're accident prone or you have a have a adrenaline junkie side, and that's that is dangerous and not okay. Yeah, you seek out danger. That's not a good match for a slayer. No, 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 no. Oh. And then I no, had no, no. I have this headcanon now that Owen doesn't make it to senior year. Like <gasps> he is definitely someone who ends. I bet this track record of seeking yeah. out danger continues. And I bet he ends up getting killed by another vampire. He dies at some point. He mm -hmm. has to, right? Yeah. I was just like, I, I had that thought and I was like, no, I'm certain. He ends up being a Sunnydale casualty. But like the casual in casualty. Because he's probably not to victim blame, but putting himself in very dangerous, vulnerable situations. And, you know, reaps the consequences. Totally. Yeah. I feel like victim blaming is a little different when you're in a town full of vampires then we can kind of be like you should not do that there's precautions you can take and like you can be safe yes. and i know that sometimes like especially in sunnydale there's no amount of safe you can be at some point but i feel like owen probably doesn't try very hard oh yeah oh yeah 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 dude like walks through a cemetery at night or something which is a sketchy thing to do anyways don't do that yeah. anyways but still yeah, he even does not in a... he does not live to fight in the battle of sunnydale high school i don't think he does um i noted a very 90s item willow is drinking one of those do you remember those little juices that would have the twist off things and then it would um you would know it if i showed it to you it was it was so casual just one of those plastic juice whatever it'll be on social media friends okay. look at it hmm. but um interesting i it took me back to my time enjoying those juices as well and i'm happy that willow was i knew she was enjoying it because they're delicious mm, that's lovely anyways i have another yet another spinoff idea with giles uh but did you ever hear the story uh, the show pennyworth um no. so it's about it's basically a prequel to batman about uh 
Alfred Pennyworth. Um, oh. The butler Alfred. Yeah. Um, because it is in some, in some of the comics, it does mention his like special English special forces, forces training and that kind of thing. And we see briefly towards the end when... Um, and this, I think this is a significant moment between Buffy and Giles because it's kind of his, kind of his first like parental talk, like mm-hmm. consoling mm-hmm. her after. And again, and it's consoling after a very normal thing of like, and a very mature thing of her choosing not to stay with Owen because she probably thought she blew it and then didn't. She could mm-hmm. have just been like, cool, guess I can still date him. And no, she, she stepped back and took the very mature move. And he mentions, I was called, my parents told me that I was destined to be a watcher at the age of nine. Nine? Mm. Jeez, old Pete's. Like, I think I still thought I was going to be a, a Spice Girl at nine. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so thinking about that, what other stuff does that mean for Giles' life growing up before he gets to be a 40-something librarian in Sunnydale, California? you know, from age nine to whatever. What does watcher training look like? You know, did he grow up with other members of the Watcher's Council? You know, I think that would be such a great prequel to explore. And I think there would be so much there. And we do see in later seasons, when we see more of the Watcher's Council, there are female watchers. So there could be absolutely more diversity. And there's watchers from all over the globe. And Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, what else they're doing throughout the year because you know there's only one slayer so what work do they have there's one slayer and one watcher who's with that slayer so what are the rest of them doing this whole other time i've always wondered that too yeah that would be so interesting to explore well, she calls them out on it later which is bad ass i fucking love it because they deserve it but it's interesting that is really interesting. Yeah. What an interesting thought experiment. I don't want Joss Whedon to do it because fuck that dude. But no, somebody else, but somebody else do it. Um, some female writer. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe, a, maybe a person of color. I think they could do a great job with it. And it could be maybe an HBO Max show, Ooh. you know, because they're doing all, could they're doing all the DC Press. stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could do that. Um, I wrote down similar kudos for Giles in this scene, especially as kind of scoldy as he's been during the episode Mm -hmm. this is just a really nice like he's not just some sort of trainer some sort of teacher he really is a parental figure and that's really nice yeah and he does have a good moment of you know admitting his his lack of knowledge he says you know i don't have a manual for how to actually do this so i love i love that admittance because i think i think that's important to take responsibility and accountability it's all, mm. all good things. And then at the end, I just think they did such a good job with the anointed one bait and switch. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't actually the crazy dude. It was it was the kid in the yeah. bus. And this whole anointed one, like the existence of the anointed one stuff, ends up having a very interesting arc between season one and season two, which we'll see later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- that's a very interesting journey. And I do I do love a bait and switch. Um, and I do love what that says, maybe even in the greater like metaphor of Buffy, of like the things that end up being a big deal to you aren't always what you think are going to be. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. I Allie. just now oh. in this moment thought of that. Allie, you brilliant, beautiful bitch. <laughs> what about that alliteration, huh? I love me some alliteration. Almost as profound as your wait. Um so uh, the only other fun fact I have about this episode as I was doing research, I didn't know this. Owen, in the original script, his name was Chambers. And I am glad they changed it to Owen. I don't know why they changed it. That was it, his first name? That was his. Yeah, Owen was initially named Chambers as he was identified in it. Owen Thurman. Yeah, oh, Owen Thurman. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. They talk about that in the cafeteria. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, I I can sort of get where it's supposed to be this sort of like eclectic, you know, to go with his whole like moody personality. But yeah, Owen is much better. Um. Anyways, what are your favorite quotes, Allie? I think it was. I think we mentioned all. Yeah, of mine. I think we we definitely mentioned. Yeah, we mentioned all of mine. We hit all of mine. Well, a moral of the story that I saw, and I wonder if you saw any others, Allie. Mm-hmm. Just this idea that. You're going to have to make sacrifices one day. And it's not going to be fair. 
Mm -hmm. Shucks. It's not fair. And that's life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, I don't think I've ever had to make any sacrifices or make any choices such that if I don't do it, somebody's going to die. But <laughs> but that's the great part about Buffy is that we can still relate to pieces of it, even if it's not, you know, a direct one to one. Because, yeah. yeah, there have been times where it's just not fair. You have to do something and that you still right. have to do it. And it's just life and it sucks. Yeah, you can't have it all. I definitely yeah. like, you know, I feel like a lot of kids end up going through this when you're a little kid and you don't have homework and shit like you can do a million and one activities and then you get older and eventually you have to like drop some of those activities and that ends up sucking and i miss yeah, just i miss sucks, gymnastics man that's one of the that's mm. like the one that got away mm. you're learning how to crack a whip you can always revisit gymnastics if you want to that's true also you know pole dancing so mm, that's true. one of my, my current hobbies. One day when we're allowed to go places and exercise without a mask and touch things without washing our hands 10 times, then I'll be able to go to outside activities instead of just working out at home. How about that? What a day it will be. What a day. What a day. Well, uh, Nicholas, shall we shall we wrap this mother up? Let's wrap this mother up. All right. I think that does about does it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again for our next episode where we'll discuss Season 1, Episode 6, The Pack. And if you were just too excited to wait until our next episode to chat, send us an email at tabularasabpod at gmail.com, and you can also say hello to us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at at tabularasabpod, spelled the same way. Allie. Yes. Where can people find you on social media? Well, Nick. They can find me at Daughter Pick on Twitter and Instagram. That's D-A-U-G-H-T-E-R-P-I-C-K. And they can find me on TikTok as at Future Black Cat. And oh, if you would like to support me in my journey as a budding artist, hungry actor, you know, you can toss me a couple bucks over at buymeacoffee.com slash Alley Press. You can join one of the memberships and read more about what my journey has been like as a young actor. And folks, let me just tell you, Allie's Not So Weekly updates are amazing, <laughs> engaging, love them every time, totally check them out. And if you didn't catch any of that, don't worry. All of our social media handles are in the description. Until next time... Allie, I love you very much. I love you. Make some proud choices. Yes, folks, make proud choices. Mwah! Tabula Rasa, bitches, is hosted by Ali Press and Nick Mercer, with music by Inflaton Cult, artwork by Charlotte Fleming Design, and consultation by Evo Terra. Evo Terra.